Hello, and welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. Today, the guys discuss what it looks like to actually learn from our Christian brothers and sisters. Walk away from today having a greater understanding of what the rest of the church can offer for you in your daily life and on mission. All right, Brad, what's um, your favorite sticker on your water bottle? Favorite sticker on my... Good yeah. question. Yeah. I have a lot of stickers on my water bottle. Yeah. If you can see, I don't know which camera would be able to see that the best, but um, my favorite is probably the Buckeye Leaf. Did you steal that from a Ohio State football so player? This is Did this you- is a fun story. So I broadcasted my junior year for Ohio State football, and they gave everyone who worked for the team a Buckeye Leaf nice. because we won the national championship oh, that year. Nice. And so yeah. I put it on this water bottle. I actually kept it like on nothing for a long time. And then finally I was like, I need to put it on something. So it's not just like a thing in a shoe box somewhere. If, but if, if you're not a Buckeye fan, you get a, a Buckeye Leaf for every, right? You get that when you do some, a sweet On your play. helmet, like yeah, a sweet yeah, yeah. play, like a, yeah. So you want your helmet covered things. with them. We should yep. do that. Like, can we do that somehow? Like for, for our missionaries? That like, would actually be them, cool. Yeah. Like, the number of play, there are players that they, they do so well in a season that they cover their whole helmet and they'll have like, um, what am I trying to say? Like a, an armband with like additional ones on it. Nice. But, um, the funniest thing about that sticker though, is whenever uh, I'm traveling to speak or going to a college campus to talk about the Damascus missionary program or whatever. Um, sometimes in the airport, I'll be sitting and like, just like typing away and someone will be like, Oh dude, legalize. And like point at it, thinking <laughs> that it's a weed leaf. So if you can see it, nice. it kind of looks that way, but it's, uh, it's actually the best because then I get to have conversations with people that I don't think otherwise would be drawn to most of the stickers. On <laughs> I, my water bottle. Thought you were gonna say, I thought you were like, dude, you played for the Buckeyes. I thought they'd think you were. So it's funny. Player, like but... almost no one, uh, like outside of big 10 fans really yeah. has a concept of it. So, but I have some other ones. Yellowstone. I was, I was flying yesterday. Like joy here at Damascus. Um, and the disastrous thing happened when they're like, this flight will be full. And you're like, oh man, I'm going to have to be smashed, you know? So yeah. I'm like, okay, just, I, and I have an aisle seat. So I'm ha- so happy I have my aisle seat. And I'm like, please Lord, just let the middle seat be someone who's a little tiny. So I could like do my computer work. And no, uh, this like gigantic human being yeah. of a person, he had to have been like a pro football player or so, like just he's in the is, middle. Like, uh, and oh, he's in the middle. Oh, and like, it, I didn't feel bad for him, but I felt bad for myself because his, his shoulders <laughs> extended beyond the, like, and so <laughs> his shoulder, like he, I think he was probably comfortable, but I was unable, like, and, and we were just shoulder to shoulder the whole time. I was just, yeah. you are a large man, but no, ironically, he never played like college or pro ball, but he was just a giant beam. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I think there's something about like, it just tells a story. So I think like, um, athletes have different, uh, ways, like a ton of the guys in the high state football team had tattoos and stuff. And I, uh, I don't have tattoos, but I put a bunch of stickers on water oh, bottles. Oh, this is your your ex, your self expression. I think so. Yeah, it's a way. <laughs> I always, of it. I, my kids are obsessed with their water bottles with stickers. I hate stickers on anything because really? like, uh, I'm afraid it's gonna like I'm like, am I going to be committed to this sticker forever? Mm. But that's awkward because I'm worried about the sticker. But I actually really do like, like tattoos. tattoos. I think that's funny. super cool. Have you guys? Uh, yeah. Well, Aaron, how do you feel about tattoos before I launch in? I don't have any tattoos, but I think it's mostly just because of laziness. Yeah. Oh, so you've just never like been convicted enough to go. So and, if I like uh, get ask you get to go get a tattoo with me, Aaron, no, it started. Would you be- I'm sorry, it started that way. But then when once people start liking something, I just I generate a a deep seated conviction against it. Well, yeah, yeah, so I, I I feel some of that in the contrarian. My stance. my my lack of tattoos is mostly because Dan likes tattoos. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I bet I bet most people in your like life love tattoos, Aaron. Right? Like you go to St. John Newman for mass on Sunday, everyone's covered in tattoos. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you, did you get Face your first tattoo. tattoo when it was still like? Was it kind of like? Uh, outside the norm? Was it like a novelty to go get a tattoo? Oh, I feel got like his now, first tattoo when I feel he was like still wearing every, spike bracelets. Yeah, okay. I was, when I was yeah. a punker, I was doing that. I feel like everyone has tattoos yeah. now. But I think the, it's one of those things that's come in vogue. Oh, it has come in vogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, uh, my, my take on tattoos, I wonder what you guys think about this. I think it is, uh, we don't have to fully flush it out here. No pun mm. intended, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wait, what but, is flushing? Flesh, flesh, flesh oh. it out. It's like, I, here's the bones, but we don't have to put flesh on it, you know? Got it, thanks. But anyway, I, my take is this. Oh yeah, we definitely need to get those. Yeah. Give give me some. Um, but um, I think there's clearly a point at which tattoos go too far. So there's a point at which tattoos no longer have you look the way that you were made to look. I think that 
I'm not sure how you can assess mm. when that line is crossed until it's crossed. Because is say, it kind of like the line where if you replace body parts with oh, machines, that at some point you become <laughs> yes, a machine? It is. No, it's similar to that. It is yeah, similar. So to Aaron that. has a titanium rod in his back, so that's okay. But if he had one in his leg as well, that'd yes, be no yes. longer acceptable for a human. No, not that. No, it's it's a person question though. Like, <laughs> how, there's clearly a point how much at which are you allowed to do mo- body modification before? It's gone too far. That is the question. Yeah. I actually think oh. it's a reasonable question. Bearded Jack Parker. Could that be a question? Can I submit a question to beyond at Damascus.net at some point? You How could. Far? I don't know who's going to ask. Uh, okay. I if gonna, if yeah. I did, if I did ever get a tattoo though, which I don't, I don't see on the horizon, but I, I'm really passionate about the Martha and Mary story. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it would be only one thing. Mm-hmm. I would get three words, only one thing. Cause I, I just, oh, okay. I think that's, it's so, like a call. Mm. I, so I can see an, I can see a reason to have something that's like a common callback, like tattooed on your body. I think that many tattoos that people get are just because they get into the excitement of getting one and then they don't want to have it later. But that's a whole different. Jack, do you have a a better question for us to ask (laughs) today? I'm just trying to like edge us into like territory where all of our listeners are like, we can't stand any of it. I was about to go on such a great tangent too, but go, go Jack. Were you going to eat me alive? No, no, I was going to (laughs) eat. Yes. All right. I would actually love if weird we were phrase. like eat you a lot. Yes. Let's do. Is that. Is that not used often? Am Can I, I using that out of question? Context? Is it morally acceptable to <laughs> eat me alive? <laughs> <laughs> that might not even be a phrase. I don't even know if I'm no, using you did, it right. You did. You did. You did yeah. Okay. Like you were gonna like yeah. yeah, yeah. Go at my uh, points apart. Okay. Just right. Yeah. Jack, question of the week. Save us from just <laughs> really everything. everything. Yeah. How do I approach learning from our non-Catholic? Uh, Christian brothers and sisters without letting that influence me away from Catholic church teaching. Oh, wow. <laughs> how do I approach that's learning? That's a long from question. Our, yeah. Can you repeat it one I more think time? That's the most substantial question we've ever asked. How do I approach <laughs> learning from our non-Catholic brother and sister? Okay. Yeah. Without, without letting that influence me away from the Catholic church. Ah, teaching. Hmm. I actually really like this question. All right. Then go first, Brad. Let me go first. Okay, sweet. Um, I will go first. Uh, I, let me make it succinct. So um, I listen to Bishop Barron a lot because I, I think he has a lot of amazing things to say to the church in our generation. And uh, one of his mentors was Cardinal George when he was in Chicago. And he quotes Cardinal George pretty often. And when he does, he often uses this quote. And um, I might be paraphrasing, but it's something like this. It's I, that I, I the, hope you don't have this memory. <laughs> <laughs> it's that the, the Catholic church has all of the gifts that God desires for his people. But that doesn't mean that we, in all seasons, use all of those gifts as well as we should. Hmm. And I, I, I've i loved that quote because it gives me a disposition of charity to all of my Christian brothers and sisters. Because what I can, what I can hold at the same time is that there is this um, beautiful grace that's been given the church to have a treasure trove of all of the things God desires for his people. But that doesn't mean that in all seasons, we're even realizing that that part of the treasure trove is with us or that we're using the parts of the treasure trove we have access to as well as we could be. And because of that, there there could be reason to believe that some of our Christian brothers and sisters that are not within the walls of our particular parish or even in the denomination of Catholicism have aspects that they're getting really right. And that is really, really fun. And because I think I, I have a unique take on this too, because where I grew up, it's kind of the beginning of the Bible belt. Mm-hmm. So almost everyone there is Protestant, but, but like, and I'm, but I mean to say almost everyone, like almost no one you would find where I'm from would be atheist. They, they just don't believe like none of them have a, pre, uh, a pretentiousness that would suggest they're smarter than what a lot of people have believed. And I'm not saying that every person who denies faith is like that, but they're all just kind of like, yeah, we believe, but they believe in like a general Protestantism is probably what I would say. There's not a lot of Catholics. And so growing up, it was actually funny because I I went to the Catholic school in the area and there was constantly comments like, you guys aren't even Christian. Or like, there was a lot of things that I just didn't understand. So I had in my mind a real dichotomy uh, between Protestants and Catholics, which in some senses there are, but in other senses they're they're not. And I had them on like totally different like Mm -hmm. ends of the, ends of the, I don't even know if spectrum, but just like ends of the belief, um, yeah, yes, spectrum. So I will go back to Cardinal George and say that like when you're interacting with a a, a Protestant brother and, and sister, or I think you said non-Catholic brother or sister, go with them with the general like charity to say, you might know something I don't about something I should know about. 
And like, and if we can take that disposition in, like you might know something more about something I should know about. First of all, even if we take that to our non-believing um, friends that are in the world, I, I think there's still something where you can find it's the, it's the Aquinas principle that at the bottom of every pursuit is the pursuit of God, right? Like exactly. at the bottom of everything is the pursuit of that, which is highest. And so long story short, I think that the way to approach non-Catholic brothers and sisters without losing our Catholic identity is to understand that the Catholic church does have a unique grace to have all of the gifts God desires for his people under one roof. However, it doesn't mean that at certain times we haven't misplaced some of those. So let's approach dialogue with our uh, Protestant brothers and sisters and those in the world with, you might know something more about something I should know about. Yeah. And I think that's, a yeah, good I think discussion. that's awesome. I, I mean, uh, other people highlight different things. Like if I, like it, even, even if you just look inside the church, well, Franciscans are going to highlight a part of the gospel in a way that Dominicans aren't right. And then Domin yeah, and Benedictines sure. are going to highlight a part of the gospel that Franciscans aren't. And so different charisms exist amongst different people. So a Protestant brother or sister may be highlighting something mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. needs to be highlighted for, for you as an individual. And so that's a good thing. But I even say like Cardinal George's quote, is they, the, the church has everything and it, it has all the gifts we need for salvation. Um, but I think even like we can learn from anyone, like, right. And sure. like the, 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 um, the, the church has been learning from others and other cultures since our inception, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, I went to Japan this past year and I was so, I was kind of blown away when going to some of these Buddhist monasteries and stuff, because it was like, oh wait, they dip their hands in water too, to purify their hands before going into the church. Oh wait, they have incense as well. Oh wait, they have votive candles as well. Oh wait, they have a uh, prayer intention cards that they, that they leave at the foot of a statue as well. There's these, there are certain aspects of timeless expressions of the faith that like, I, I, I don't, were we the first ones ever to use incense? Probably not, you know? And so um, mm -hmm. there's there's things that we saw other cultures in, in, and the church has a history of seeing other cultures or other spiritualities do something and, and then Christianizing it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an element of what can we learn mm -hmm. from this situation? Mm -hmm. And I have and one so, word for that. Paul yeah. at the Acropolis. Like, yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's this like, anathema. Yeah. Anathema, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, yeah. Well, but I actually, that's interesting because like even when we read the Council of Trent, like I, I think that we do find in the the angle of how it's written yeah. something that I find in, in myself sometimes, which is like a hyper reactivity. It's like, oh, but like I, I need to have solid lines. And I think the church was right to set up lines. But now it's like, but I don't have to fear like entertaining someone who's on a different side of the line than me. I think that's, I, I think that's just fundamentally anti-Christian. Like we, we haven't done that since, since Jesus Christ was here. Like Jesus went to the woman at the well, like he, he went, he wanted those who followed him to go yes, into Judea, but into Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Like, like yeah. Jesus never was like, Hey, don't dialogue or have conversation with people that are across the line than you out of fear that they might, oh no, that actually connects it to the left. I think I heard it from one of you first is like old Testament, you touch the leper and you get leprosy. I think it might've been mm -hmm. you, Aaron, uh, new Testament, you touch the leper, they get clean. Yeah. Like there, there's a part of like Jesus changes something yeah, where I don't absolutely. have to just walk around fearful that I'm picking up like this, like broken schema that I have That's to great, like hide bro. from. Right. That's great. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'll throw a little uh, you, you labeled me earlier as a contrarian. I'll throw a little contrarian <laughs> twist on this. I as, love it. As well as maybe Ugh. a good a good word Rebound. rooted in virtue. So I, th I think you actually have to approach this. Rebound. How should I approach this? With humility. I've, I've got I've got to approach this with humility, and and I think um, an openness to actually changing my mind. Right. If if you encountered a truth that was truer than the thing that you claim to believe would you change your mind mm. or would you, or would you buckle down and say like, no, I'm right. Right. Cause I think, I think that that is actually the way that most of us tend to operate when it comes to conversation with someone we, we disagree with or someone that we're not formed in the same community with that we just assume like there are, there are certain things that are off limits. And if you start speaking to me, something that, that convicts me, like it's witchcraft. And I'm not going to actually allow my heart to be, to be moved or motivated by a pursuit of truth. So I've got to have a deep enough belief in Jesus that the actual pursuit of truth is going to lead me to him. And, and, and therefore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
by by connection is going to lead me to the the truth of the church, the truth of the Catholic Church. But I, I would say for for many people, myself included, and I'll I'll give a brief little testimony to this. Um, we have set up for ourselves golden calves and claimed that they are Catholicism, and they're not. And our our unwillingness to change, or our unwillingness to be open to a different perspective, actually puts us in a box that's not good. Yeah. What's an example of that? Yeah. So I I, I I've shared this in the show I think before, but when mm-hmm. I was in high school, like my um my sole motivation in pursuit of the faith was through apologetics. I thought like this was the way to transform the world. Um, if we were going to have any meaningful impact as a we ministry, have to have better it, arguments than it, everyone it, else. It had to be through through apologetics, and. Um, what it, it, how'd that work out for you? Well, it, uh, if it you was know incomplete. Me, if you know me now, <laughs> <laughs> it was incomplete. Uh, and I love apologetics. It's, it's great. There's, there's a, there's a time and a place. And, uh, what, I found myself in an experience where, I don't know, eight, 10 years of, of that as my, as my primary motivation. Um, I was just left empty and I was, I was doing the youth ministry thing and it just, it wasn't fulfilling. It wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling my heart. And I don't know whether God placed it there um, or, or whether, whether it was just a, a, a rut that I had found myself in, but um, the, the escape for me, right? The way that God came and, and shook me out of that, of that idol that I think I had set up for myself and, and brought me to a place of, of real meaningful encounter with him and the church was through actually humbling myself and putting myself in a place to be formed meaningfully by people who are outside of the church. So um, a, a close friend of mine, um, Megan um, Baum and I uh, started really listening to and being fed by some of the teachings down Louis Giglio down in Passion Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And again, uh, do, I, do I wholeheartedly agree with every theological point the guy communicates? Absolutely not. But it was it was actually putting myself in a place of of realizing like that that I can be fed and formed by people that are different than me. Yeah, that's I mean that I think changed everything. <clears throat> yeah, I think going back to like your first point, Aaron was is that the pursuit of truth will always lead to truth, right? Like if I'm pursuing truth, it's mm-hmm. going to end in God, and that's that's the really spirit big. of truth will lead you to all truth. Yeah, and that's been the the Catholic understanding forever, right? Yeah. That we mm-hmm. we're we're not against science, we're not against biology, we're not yep. against philosophies, right? That that we the pursuit of truth is going to end in God if it's an authentic pursuit. Yeah. And so if I'm if I'm going to my non Catholic brothers and sisters pursuing truth, right? Then and I'm uh, I'm going to it's it's going to bring me into a deeper relationship with God yeah. who mm-hmm. is truth. And but, it, it's possible that the Protestant preacher down the street or on television may actually have a more truthful interpretation of the scripture than my theology teacher, right? We, we, I think we have to be open because that, my that's, theology, a, that's a scary path yeah, to walk. Well, it, my theology teacher wasn't perfect. Right. And, and, and what you were saying, Brad, not ev- like we, we may have the fullness of truth. That doesn't mean the, the truth was communicated perfectly to us yeah. in our high school yeah. religion class. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Well, I think the humility point is so big because like, I, I'm not going to speak for you, Aaron, but I had a very similar, like in my early stages of conversion, like I'm going to get the arguments right, you know? And there was just a pride in that because like the reality is at that time, I, instead of pursuing truth, I wanted to pursue being right. Like that's just, that's just how it is. And, yeah. and how many dialogues do we have in our life where we just want to be right? Like, it's not even like, and I, that's why I love the way you framed it, Aaron. Like, let's like, let's say that you and I were having a discussion and Aaron actually has a, like a path towards what seems logically coherent and mm-hmm. true that is different than my predisposition. Am I willing to change that? That is literally the frame of if it's an honest dialogue or not. Yeah. If, if that's not there, then all it is is competing monologues to see who can, who can like out mm-hmm. and win. And, what, and that's not the right aim. One of my favorite phrases that captures this in the, in the context of, of Catholicism and, and even canon law is that, is that we must not um, prevent what, uh, we must not prevent what the church herself permits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, for, for me to, for, you know, you, you hear this, especially in, in the context of, of conflict between, uh, you know, the, the, the quote unquote liturgy wars, uh, yeah, right. conflict between the self-labeled progressives or, or, uh, conservatives and charismatics or, or progressives, whatever, whatever the case may be like that, that 
that we've, we've sort of established a label that something is or isn't Catholic. And we just got to be sure that we're actually standing on reality. Yeah. Am, is, am I trying to codify my preference? Um, or is this, or is this actually a critical, yep. you know, quote unquote salvation issue? And more often than not, uh, preference doesn't make it all the way there. Well, and ecumenism is realized like the church permits ecumenism and encourages ecumenism and it's, it, it is promoted through dialogue. And yeah. so it's in order to, for dialogue to happen, I have to listen to others so that they'll listen to me. And yeah. I think yeah. that as a, I know that as a Catholic, when I associate with and put myself in a learning position or an inquisitive position around my Protestant brothers and sisters, they're much more likely to put themselves in an inquisitive learning position to me. That's yeah. great. So yeah. that it, my, my own curiosity of what they believe, why they believe it, how they evangelize, what strategies they're using to reach the lost, that inquis inquisitive nature mm -hmm. creates them to ask me, yeah, and what are you, what are you guys doing? And how are mm -hmm. you reaching the lost? And then I can share aspects of Eucharistic adoration that is a very tangible expression, an incarnational encounter with God that is make like it facilitates an encounter with God in such a powerful way. Yeah. Right. That yeah. this opens a door for real discussion of these important truths. Yeah. Well I think there's a there's there's a brilliant like concept that's spoken about by many theologians that are working towards which towards, ones towards unity. Well, no, the, I'm just right, sorry, <laughs> yeah, you're like you're like call me on my receipts. Here you go. Um, but, but no, no please, like, yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah. Expedite the process. But um, I think uh, th this c concept between unity and uniformity. Like mm -hmm. there, there's like the, the pursuit of the church is that we would be in unity, but that's not always going to look uniform. Like e even look at the church in Africa and how they're celebrating the, the mysteries of the mass and look at any Western country and how they celebrate the mystery. It, it is just not uniform, but there's unity in it. Like, so you can see the elements of it, the, the truth, like what the germ prescribes and things like that, but it takes on these flavors and that's actually beautiful. That's actually like we shouldn't demand conformity where the church allows for diversity of expression. Like that is, that is a, that's a problem. And, and it is a, and I think it really is a, a heart problem. Like, like I, I've been um, kind of recognizing in my life, I have a real desire to bring two extremes towards the middle in almost all circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I usually, if someone comes in very passionate on like a wing of something, I just come in on the other wing because my passion is towards the middle actually. And one of the areas like, I was reading recently Sacrosanctum Concilium and just in like, your spare time. Can you say that three times fast. <laughs> Sacrosanctum Concilium, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Sacrosanctum Concilium. <laughs> um, but like, it, like, it's this beautiful document that comes out of Vatican II, but it's in the exact same document where we see, like, hey, maybe we, we could have a pride of place for Gregorian chant and versus Popolum is a more than appropriate posture to take in the Mass, which just means to the people in the same document. Like in like in, in usually like two sides will either say both like those couldn't co like yeah. you can't have both of Great. them. It's like no. If, if of you're course, angry at Brad, can you just please leave like, just comments comment no, just for days? But no, I I was like Brad, blown away. I no, didn't know. Noteworthy, the, the preference for Gregorian chant is in the Latin mass. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Can yeah, I? I would love to read that more. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. But you, you can see the, the the wait before you shoot that. You, you can see kind of right. like like one anyway. That document is giving this diversity of expression no, I love and, it. and we're yeah anyway no it's, it's we a bunker concept. down in our camp and say every document says what i say it's yeah. like really because yeah. i i'm not sure that's true i agree <laughs> got one all right guys two cents oh, oh, right. so close. <laughs> yeah, that was a really great shot thanks all right hey um <laughs> i just how, punched the microphone i don't know if that messed up anything essentially but. the question was how do i look to my non-catholic brothers and sisters and make sure i I don't mess up. Is that really kind of what they're saying? <laughs> well, and not lose your Catholicism, yeah, I think, yeah, was yeah. the, with the I, general I, I think, so I do think there is a level of discretion. So I, I have no concern listening to like a ton of Protestant preachers on YouTube because I have a master's degree in theology. And so I think I, there are certain red flags that stick out to me. Like, whoa, there, that is a Calvinistic style yeah, anthropology. It's part of the and tulip. I, yeah. You can, you can yep. just feel it right away. So I do think there are people who don't have theology degrees that probably should be a little bit more discerning. And so I think the, 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 it, it would be very effective if you know your sidelines, right? So like kind of in football, I, I can, I can play on the whole field and, but I can't like, I, I don't want to go out of bounds. And I think that's where like when interfaith dialogue or interfaith learning 
know know your sideline so you know like okay the this is when I go out of bounds mm-hmm. right and so if you're un, unclear then ask someone who has clarity in the Catholic faith for an understanding right so like is it okay if I go to a Protestant service to learn how Protestants are evangelizing. Is that okay? And maybe you don't know. Yes, of course, it's okay to go to a Protestant service, right? And and learn how they're evangelizing as long as you go to mass on Sunday as well, right? And so like, I think, but if if you don't know that that's a, a, an appropriate thing to do, you may f- not, you may feel like you can't do it or you may. So like, if you have questions, just ask a higher theological source above you. Um, and then if you are meant to be the higher theological source, right? If you're a leader of an apostolate, then make sure you have a higher le- like theological source, right? And that's why we're, to some extent, the tradition of a spiritual director is important because if theologians or ministers are going to be trying to do minis- the new evangelization and, and ardently striving for new methodology, new mm-hmm. expressions, right? As John Paul II calls for in the new evangelization, then you need to have a spiritual director that you're able to throw some of these things to, to, to be able to say like, hey, actually that expression, that, that that's 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 a violation of like, and so, so being able to walk with a spiritual director, if you're a ministry leader and then have a ministry leader that you can turn to if you're not like in full-time ministry or have so that you you remain in obedience in some way and you remain, if you will, in the safety of the theological tradition of the church and, and, and so that you understand you have another person. And then I would even say almost checks and balances, right? Like in a way of like throw your questions out to your brothers and sisters in the faith. And yeah. so like, I mean, the, the amount, most of um, our bantering of real theological questions or real theological discussions happens off air, but the three of us are mm-hmm. always throwing out different ideas and thoughts. I saw this. What do you think? Or I thought that like, I heard this way. I read this. What do you, and we're, we're wrestling with these truths and that's, it is, it, it's, um, that's actually, that is Catholic the- theology, right? Like asking these questions, it's incarnation. wrestling yeah, with it's, these truths, yeah. discussing them. That's where theology happens. And so it isn't just, and I think sometimes our current expression of teaching theology confuses us because it's like, well, this textbook says this and it's all infallible. And I have to believe everything the textbook says as the textbook says it. And it doesn't allow for discourse of theological thought and, uh, and growth. And so I think there's, there's a lot of value that can happen from understanding our sidelines, but then playing within, within the, the, the playing field. And I think just a few examples of this I've seen is I think we do a, a good job of, um, encouraging our missionaries to kind of go out and listen to, Hey, you should listen to this podcast. You should listen to this, um, this preacher. And we learn from different, uh, faith leaders and different denominations. But then we, we also, before we send them out, we give them our house rules. Right. And so Damascus has house rules. So you have heard it said, but I say to you, right. And that's what, that's what Jesus does at the sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but I say to you, He's kind of course correcting the different theological debates that are happening between the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and, and, and he's answering some of those. And I think we can do that. We know some of the charismatic theological conversations that are out there on an interfaith level. And so that's exactly what we're saying. Like, hey, you've heard us said this, but but I say to you, we're going to do it this way, right? That there's actually instruction on this is, these are our sidelines here at Damascus. And the other theologians are saying this outside the faith when it comes to the supernatural gifts, but no, we see this, it, we see the expression here in Catholicism. That's yeah. such a great response. And then when people go out of bounds, our missionaries, sometimes they go out of bounds. Like I think sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters, one area where I've noticed a lot of charismatic Protestants um, falling prey is that they go into kind of a faith alone type mentality of like, if I have enough faith, God will do it. And they, they, they almost act, ir- they, they, they suppress reason, right? Yeah, sure. So sometimes I'll, I'll see our missionaries pick that up and yeah. I'm like, hey, I actually want you to read John Paul II's Fetos et Ratio, yeah. Faith and Reason. It's not because, sola fide. It's, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That we, need, we do want to have great faith for God to work, but we also have to understand that God does work through reason as well. Of course. Well, and faith is on the far side of reason, if, if properly yeah. understood, right? That we reason to a point. And then faith is not some like absence of reason. It's you reason to where you can as a person on a thing. And then the faith is on the far side of it. And I, all, all of this takes more work and all of it bears better fruit. <laughs> it bears better of, fruit. Of but course. It also and that's means the deal, should be the goal. Sometimes people will go out of bounds. 
Yeah. Yes. And going out of bounds is not like it the may be a world. penalty, but it, yeah, the game isn't over because of that, right? And the, the person the doesn't burn analogy. in hell because of that. Yes, so that's like, the perfect analogy. If I step out of bounds, that's okay. Because yes. guess what? I can step right back in bounds. Well, especially with people that you know you're having conversations with in good faith. Like mm. I think all three of us have grown in that with each other over years is like, now when I do have something that I'm wrestling with, like in my own, like I know I'm like, I can bring this up to Dan and Aaron. And even if it's really wrong, like they're going to, they're going to wrestle with it and let me object back to them. But, but that grows in trust. I think yep. there's a huge element to this as I'm listening to both of you, like also find people in your life that are Catholic and going after mm. this thing, because those can be the people that remind like the, the officials, the referees that remind you of, of the rules of the game. Like these are the sidelines. You can't go outside and then run back in and catch or whatever. Yeah. Like that, that's helped me immensely because yeah, like, gosh, if we're not taking, if we're not taking risks, how are we even trying to touch the whole field? Yep. Because I'm trying to touch the whole field. Like there's people at every element of the field. And, and like, if, if I'm not, if I'm afraid of the sideline, I'm just going to stay with the people in the middle mm-hmm. of the field. When and I, I don't want to be afraid of the sideline. And I think the new evangelization is so important in this because like it is new in expressions, methodology, and ardor. And I think a lot of times when we John go to our, second, right? Yeah, 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 that was, that was, we said that we need a new yeah. evangelization that is new in its expressions, methodology, and ardor. And if a lot of times when we go to our Protestant brothers and sisters, we're not looking for their theological doctrine. What we're looking for is their expression of evangelization. We're looking for their ardor in evangelization. Mm-hmm. We're looking for their methodology to reach the lost. And that's really when we're, that, that's when, that's when we're going to get the most value mm-hmm from our Protestant brothers and sisters is when we see, wow, what are they doing well to reach the human heart and lead that human heart into relationship with God? A uh, comment was made earlier that when we adopt a posture of humility, it actually fosters a posture of humility in others as well. And I would say one, one of the really cool things, Dan, I think you, you, you illustrated that perfectly, that, that oftentimes uh, our, our Protestant brothers and sisters are succeeding more in terms of methodology and ardor and uh, expression, ex- expression, and um, oftentimes when when we approach them in humility, uh, that an, a, that a, a response of humility actually positions them to look to Catholicism for development of theological thought. Yep, yes. yep. So we've run into this time and time again that that you know you'll you'll, you'll show up to the bookstore of some amazing non denominational church and who's on the shelves but the Catholic mystics. Yeah, for sure. Because because there's a, a realization that hey if this truth is worth pursuing then then we've got to we've got to find it wherever it's offered yep and that just opens up an incredible dialogue yeah, yeah and and I found that to be true anecdotally because it also opens up a relationship where you're not giving unsolicited advice but you're giving advice when it's solicited yeah so I've had Protestant brothers and sisters that'll ask a question in honest like like seeking and it'll be like oh I know the church knows that. And so then I get to answer instead of like coming in with like a preconceived agenda as to what I'm going to deliver to them in relationship with them, they'll ask questions like, how, how should we understand this scripture? And I'm like, oh, I don't need to know that. Origin knew that. Like, I, I don't need to know that. Uh, John Chris Awesome knew that. Like, I, I don't need to know that. Aquinas knew that. Yep. And, and that is a real beauty. So like, I, I, before we kind of move, I think towards mission of the week, like if you're listening, like that's the beauty, Mm -hmm. like, like none of what we're saying is, is escaping from the beauty that we have these resources at our fingertips. It's just, we need to live those resources out in relationship. If ministry is not, uh, incarnational and it's simply logical, then, then we're not even like human. (laughs) Like like it has to be lived out in a way that I think you said that perfectly, Aaron, like it, Mm -hmm. it comes into the circumstance that we're in in humility and then does what it can. With yeah. It. You know, it's, it would be very interesting to kind of give yourself a litmus test as to what would be appropriate for you as a Catholic to, to involve yourself in Protestant dialogue. To what extent do you want the Protestant to involve themselves in your Catholic dialogue? So if we're going to love our neighbor as ourself, then if I want the Protestant to come and learn about Marian devotion, if I want the Protestant to come and learn about the Eucharist, sacraments. if I want the Protestant to come and learn about sacraments, yeah, if, if I want them to come in and see and learn and listen to me, then I should be willing to do the same to them. And I like to, to simply, if, if whatever, to what extent you want them to come to you, you should go to them or you, you should have permission to go to them. I love that. Um, right before I, I'll throw it over to you, I was listening to a podcast by, um, Dr. Bergsma today, actually. And if you've never, Bergsma. if you've never listened to Dr. Bergsma, well, he's, it, but the thing is his intellect though, has not allowed a shell to like 
grow around his heart. Like, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. so smart, but he's so in like, love. I love, I love him. Yes. And with the people he's teaching, with the people he's talking to, with the people he's arguing with, like he is like just a, uh, I think he's a case study for charity. Like I think mm, he's great, amazing. Brad. You gave him such a good pr- promotion. Now everyone's going to listen to his podcast. And, and not ours. No, 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 but, no I, <laughs> but it's building off what you were saying. Cause one of the things he, um, one, one of the things he was mentioning is just like the, the, yeah, the, we as Catholics don't have to be afraid of losing our Catholicism when we truly understand it. Like when we truly understand it, it's like all these things are oriented towards it. I just want to get on the the path that sees the beautiful fulfillment of all of the things for it. He was just talking about like he went into this class that he knew had an atheistic tilt and he knew it was going to be the best arguments for atheism. And part of him was scared to go into the class because he's like, what if I'm proven wrong? And then as he got in the class, he's like, oh no. Like, I'm just seeing all the things that I, I believe different. Like, like, it's just mm. like building, like, mm-hmm. if, if we really understand it, we can be more humble. We can, we, because it's all been grace that's been given to us. I kind of want to go do just a class on, uh, atheism now. That sounds like fun. Well, I, I mean, like, yeah, yeah, I, I, you should listen to it. I think Matt Frad interviewed him, but cool. let's start to mission of the week. You want to do it? Mission of the week. Oh man. Okay. You put me on the spot. I um, did. Yeah. Very quick. And Berg's my shift. And then, yeah, no, mm. I, I, I think, I, I think I, if mission of the week, it would be really good for you to, um, I don't, I don't know if writing is what you do, but if you want to journal kind of what do you love the most about the Catholic faith? So why do you love your Catholic faith and root yourself in that firm faith that this is why I love you Catholic church and why I'm not going to leave. And as, as long as you know your personal why of what roots you in your faith, then you can go and play ball on the field and not be worried that you're going to lose your faith. So root yourself deeply in the church with a heart and a love for her. And if that love's there, I don't think you have to be worried that you're going to lose your Catholic faith. That's the best. That's really good. Aaron, you want to close us in prayer? I think that's- I would love to. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, Lord, thank you for stretching us and for, for demonstrating time and time again that you never leave us alone. So Jesus, stay close by our side. And I pray that this, I pray that this conversation today was challenging to those who are, who are uh, tuning into this show. Um, Lord, stretch us out of complacency and let us eagerly desire the truth that you offer us, the truth that you offer in love and to not be afraid of pursuing whatever it takes to find you. Um, Jesus, make our path clear and give us the grace and the opportunity and the courage to say what? Yes. When you call. Amen. 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 Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, this has been Beyond Damascus, a show where encounter meets mission. Let's be in relationship. So if you are listening to this podcast and you think that it would benefit someone in your life, send it to them. If that starts a dialogue, great. Drop those comments into the comment section. E- email us at beyondadamascus.net. Like let's get a let's get a conversation going around these topics so we can be in relationship and bring mission to the world. Cause this isn't supposed to be a show that just talks about mission, mm-hmm. but a show that's on mission. And we want to be on mission with you. If you haven't already uh, like this video, subscribe to this channel. It helps it go further. It helps it reach more people. It helps more people be on mission for the Lord. And that's what we all want anyway. And then let me remind you as always that mission makes, makes sense. sense because we, it, well, it, it's sense. C E N T. Get it. <laughs> I'm glad we reminded them.